Welcome everyone. I'm Marcia Smith, co-founder and president of Firelight Media. I'm a black woman with a medium Afro wearing red glasses and a salmon colored sweater with a blurred background behind me. Thank you for joining us today for our fourth and final Beyond Resilience Masterclass for 2022. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement to raise awareness of indigenous presence and land rights and to stand in solidarity with indigenous people. I am in Harlem on the land of the Munsee Lenape people. I encourage you to make your own land acknowledgement in the chat. Our chat moderator will drop a link to a resource that will help you discover whose ancestral lands you live on. Today's masterclass, which is supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, will center on producing documentaries with impact and will feature firelight supported filmmakers alongside experts in the field of impact producing. For those of you who do not know, impact producers specialize in creating and executing strategic campaigns around documentaries and other media designed to galvanize audiences around specific social actions. Firelight Media, in partnership with our sister organization, Firelight Films, has launched successful impact campaigns around films, including Stanley Nelson's The Murder of Emmett Till, The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution, and Tell Them We Are Rising, the story of historically Black colleges and universities, all of which were designed to encourage audiences who were moved by the films to take action, whether writing to the Justice Department or organizing discussions on the history and future of HBCUs. Stanley joins our conversation today to discuss that work. Firelight Media also supports impact and engagement work for our community of filmmakers through our Impact Campaigns Fund. That fund, launched in 2020, addresses a resource gap in the nonfiction space for impact and audience and engagement related projects by and for communities of color in the US. To date, the Impact Campaigns Fund has supported 19 documentary makers and their teams, enabling them to pursue their dream impact and engagement related projects. Two of our Impact Campaign Fund recipients join us today, along with their impact producers to tell us about their work. Today's event moderator will introduce them in just a moment. Firelight Media's Beyond Resilience series is supported in part by Open Society Foundations, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York City Council, the National Endowment for the Arts and Field of Vision. Our programs are also supported by our generous community of firelighters, individual donors who provide vital monetary support and encouragement that directly benefits our programs and our operations. We're in the midst of our year end fundraising campaign during which we hope to raise $10,000 before December 31st. As you think about your year end giving, I hope you'll consider supporting our work with a charitable contribution. As a firelighter, you will receive invitations to other firelight media produced events like Beyond Resilience and will join a dynamic community of filmmakers, industry professionals, and documentary fans who are actively helping to amplify Firelight's mission to change the story. You can donate right now by clicking the link in the chat or by texting the word Firelight to 44321. Again, that number is 44321 and the word is Firelight. And now, I'm happy to introduce the moderator for today's discussion, Assad Mohammed. Assad is the Vice President of Impact and Engagement Strategy at American Documentary, POV. With 20 years of service in public education, nonprofit leadership, restorative justice, and community development, Assad believes that trauma-informed care and harm reduction can be integrated in the duty of care to documentary filmmakers protagonists, and audiences. From orchestrating impact campaigns to organizing film screenings, Assad is a passionate witness to how nonfiction storytelling connects to the hearts and minds of underserved communities, to policymakers and leaders, inspiring folks to better focus their power and fight for change and transformation. Thank all of you again for joining us today. Now, please join me in welcoming Assad, who will introduce today's panelists. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a special Beyond Resilience Masterclass on producing films with impact. My name is Asad Mohammed. I'm a Black man wearing a Black turtleneck, a gray vest, and a gray cap. Uh, today, I am in Charlotte, North Carolina, on the traditional land of the Katawa, Waxhaw, Shira, and Sugary peoples, also known as Charlotte, North Carolina. I am the Vice President of Impact and Engagement at American Documentary POV, where in my role, I work on extending the impact of nonfiction films beyond the initial broadcast dates. I do this work through community engagement, education, and event production within non-commercial TV and radio stations. I'm also an impact strategist and a father. I'm lucky enough to have witnessed the films that we will discuss today come to broadcast on public media, some even on POV, and every single one of them are still making a dynamic impact in our communities. On to the conversation. Today, I'm excited to introduce our first panelists, two people who have made a significant impact with their own films and impact campaigns, and who are also family at Firelight Media. Stanley Nelson and Lloyd Limbaugh. Stanley Nelson's films combine compelling narratives with rich historical detail to shine new light on the underexplored American past. Stanley is a legend in this field. Awards received over the course of his career include a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, five primetime Emmy Awards, and Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Emmys and International Documentary Association. This year, he earned his first Oscar nomination for his highly acclaimed, impactful documentary, Attica. His most recent films are Harriet Tubman, Visions of Freedom, and Becoming Frederick Douglass, both of which premiered in October on PBS and are now available to stream via PBS Passport. My friend, Loida Limbaugh, currently serves as a consultant for Firelight Media. Loida is an Afro-Dominican filmmaker and DJ interested in the creation of art that is nuanced and revelatory for communities of color. Loida's latest film, Through the Night, is a feature documentary about a 24-hour daycare center. Through the Night nabbed a DuPont Columbia Award, was a New York Times critics pick, and had its world premiere at the 2020 Tribeca Film Festival. It aired as part of the POV series on PBS in May, 2021. And Lloyd's first film, Estilo Hip Hop, was a co-production of ITVS and aired on PBS in 2009. She's a Sundance Institute Fellow, NAACP Image Award nominee, a Doc NYC documentary new leader, badass, and a former foundation Just Films Rockwood Fellow. Additionally, she co-produces and helms the popular Brooklyn Monthly, a party called Rose, Rosie Perez. Hope you all have been blessed to attend one of her legendary parties. Thank you both for being with me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I know this conversation is going to support filmmakers and impact strategists doing work in communities and folks who are curious about how to make an impact with their film, whether that means changing the hearts and minds of people, changing systems of oppression, or even changing public policy. I'd like to start with a clip from Lloyd's film, Through the Night, which explores the personal cost of our modern economy through the stories of two working mothers and a childcare provider whose lives intersect at a 24-hour daycare center in New Rochelle, New York. Come on, Mama, time to get up. Come on. Morning, baby. All right. Noah, time to get up. I've been doing this for 22 years. I have all different types of families in my daycare. I have some that comes in at 6 o'clock in the morning that works at 8.30 at night. I have some that comes from 3.30 to 12.30 at night. I have some that comes in overnight. I see a lot of parents come in and break down. They don't want to do this but they need to work and take care of their family. All right, see you later. All right, baby, have a good day. Be careful. This is the way the world is set up at this point. Eat. You're not about 
I never really thought of overnight childcare until I had to use it. What? I've been working seven days, so almost two months. If I'm not working one job, I'm working in another job. Hi, Mommy. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Love you guys very much. It's not just a job. Turn your sheet over. This is really our life. My children, ever since they was the age of two years old, they had to share me with other children. I remember my children saying, Mommy, why do they have to come first? Mommy! As parents, you make sacrifices. It's not their fault. So I just do what I can. It's not easy, but you know, eventually I'll sleep. Do we love each other? Yeah. I didn't hear you. Yeah. Do we love each other? If you continue to have numbness, you need a surgery. Uh-oh. This work is hard. I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing because I feel like if I lay down, I'm so tired I might not get back up. All right. Loida. You and your team built a far-reaching campaign during the pandemic, such a difficult time. And we, you highlighted the often overlooked and underappreciated role of care workers. Last year, you and your team raised over $82,000 with your essential care fund, aimed at providing resources for various home-based child care providers around the country. Then last summer, you went on to have a fundraiser for Dee's Tots, the child care center featured in the film, and you've raised $15,000 to support. People, by the way, can still donate online at the GoFundMe. A mutual aid is key, as we know. I was wondering if you could talk about the experience of balancing being both a filmmaker and an impact campaign producer. What are some of the stresses and what has surprised you in doing this work or even served as a critical takeaway? Uh, sure, thank you for the question. Uh, I would say, you know, one, I was really blessed to have um, a phenomenal team of collaborators that helped me to roll out the film um, in, in all senses, uh, both, uh, you know, sort of the traditional distribution sense of releasing a film out into the world, but also the impact and engagement work. Uh, which for us, we had to redefine because, as you said, we did come out in April of 2020, uh, you know, when everything was upside down and nothing was functioning the way that we, we had always known it to. Um, and so I would say first that, you know, in my case, I, I was able to assemble um, a really powerful team of um, collaborators. I worked with an impact producer, Annie Mercedes of Lucky Lucky Pictures. Uh, who really did um, all of the legwork around holding relationships with our partners, um, both locally and nationally. And by that, I mean uh, all the different nonprofits and organizations and collectives that were already working, you know, on the sort of the front lines of issues related to working families, children, caregiving, um, all of those sort of uh, needs. Uh, connecting with them, understanding what they were, you know, what their sort of priorities were, introducing them to the film and inviting them to be in partnership with us as we released the film. Annie really held uh, that work and spearheaded it. Uh, we also had uh, Chana Ewing, who was a sort of social media digital strategist person, person for us, which was critical because we were all at home and could not do anything in person. Um, and so the way to engage folks really for us was online. Um, and, uh, and for us, it was, an, you know, we had an opportunity to kind of connect with the, the conversations that were naturally bubbling up at the time, precisely because everyone was at home, right? There was this moment where everyone was thinking about schools being closed or children or mothers or working mothers, even people that weren't necessarily in any of those categories themselves, we had a moment um, in the in the in the U.S. where we were having that conversation in a very kind of 
far reaching way and everyone was um, was engaged because of the conditions, right? The extremity of the situation. Um, and so we were able to plug into that national conversation and add what I believe was some depth and nuance to it. Um, and we also had, you know, a number of other partners and the main partners were our protagonists, um, Dolores and Nunu, uh, Nunu and Patrick Hogan, um, who are featured in the film, who themselves are caregivers and experts in their own right, but very much activists and advocates, you know, who had um, a lot to say. And so we used the moment to um, try to foreground them uh, and their leadership around issues that impact um, working class people and, and the working poor. So I mean, I think I'll stop there. I could say a lot more, but I feel like that was a mouthful. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and definitely shout out to Annie and um, Looky Looky Pictures. Um, I, um, I, like many others, have are standing on the shoulders of Black women who have uh, taken care of me, one in particular, Ruth Thelma Thomas in, in Queens, New York, growing up, took care of me and a bunch of children in the neighborhood. And I know uh, the access that you had in going into someone's home, doing such sensitive, important work in terms of supporting families and, and children. Um, just wondering how you built that relationship with Dolores and Patrick. Um, how did the experience of the impact campaign bring you closer to the story, to the protagonists, um, and the community of mothers and, and child care workers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, certainly. Uh, so in terms of approaching them and building the relationship, I, I approach them with the same kind of care that I would want to be approached, you know, um, in, in terms of, I think at the time my children were still in daycare themselves or one child was in daycare when I started working on the phone, the other one was already in school. And so I just put myself, you know, in the shoes of parents, right? A filmmaker shows up wanting to bring in cameras, you know, your children are there in, in care of these caregivers while you're off at work. And I've I just really thought about what that could what kind of concerns, right, and fears that might bring up for other people. Um, and I, I led with that, right? I led with my own lived experience as a single working mother. Um, I shared very transparently why I was interested in making the film. Uh, I also tried my best to share what I thought could come out of making the film, obviously without making any promises or guarantees either, but I, I, I painted a picture right? Like best case scenario, these are some of the things that sometimes can happen um, when you make a film, but the film has to be really good. And in order for it to be really good, you have to give me access. Um, and so, you know, we had that conversation and I explained to them what the process, you know, entailed and also asked them actively and consistently over the course of the four years of working together, um, to let me know, right? Like what their limits, what their boundaries were um, and, and ensured that those boundaries were respected because once again, at the end of the day, we were talking about people's children. Um, and I, I took that responsibility very seriously, right? To, to handle both the children um, and the space with a lot of care and respect. Uh, and so I would say, you know, that's kind of what I held at the center of, of our relationship, a lot of, um, honesty, transparency, and just kind of constantly checking in over the course of making the film. Uh, and then in terms of the impact campaign and um, and how that uh, sort of further deepened our relationship, um, I, you know, I would say the same way that I told them what, why I was interested in making the film. One, one of the things that I asked them over the course of the time we were working together was why they were participating. Um, mm -hmm. Because I always wanted to understand what it was that, what, what it was that they were looking to, to sort of share with the world. Like why open your home up? Why make yourself so vulnerable, right? You have reasons that motivate um, those actions and those decisions. And so we had conversations about that as well. Um, and like I said, both of them are activists and they see so much of what working families need and like what our communities need in terms of care and support and safety. 
because they literally like are the safety net, you know, um, for these, for this entire community. Um, and so they were really interested in sharing that with the world, you know, um, they wanted people to understand what it was like, you know, if you were having to work multiple jobs in order to pay bills and keep the lights on and things like that, um, you know, and also what potentially could be done differently, right, in terms of how caregivers are treated, compensated, respected, or not respected, right, those were things that they wanted to, to share with the world, um, and while we were designing the impact campaign, they were front and center, you know, they were a part of that process, um, both in terms of shaping it, um, shaping the goals, uh, and also doing the work. So they were on the circuit, they did a lot of events. Um, and ultimately, I would say they were really responsible for um, we we ended up making some legislative uh, change, which wasn't my goal as a filmmaker, but it was theirs. Um, yeah. We did screen the film um, a few times. I think there were like two or three screenings that we did with New York State legislators, uh, which then eventually did, um, we were told by uh, one of the assemblymen that the screening of the film with his peers helped to lead um, to them signing a, a pretty historic bill um, to stabilize childcare in New York State and childcare providers. Um, I forget the number, but it was like two point something billion. I forget the exact number that was passed um, to increase wages for childcare providers to also increase um, the sort of the limit, the income limit, the income cap that parents uh, could be at in in order to receive subsidies for childcare and a whole host of other things, including essential workers. Um, so we, you know, we ended up having, we ended up making policy change and that was a direct result of the protagonist's vision and their work, you know, um, and uh, yeah, and their clarity around what they wanted to see come out of, um, of the film and the release. I love that about your process, how you really, Kept, in, kept checking in and asking for consent and prioritize the goals that they had um, in the film. And in fact, it made the impact campaign that much stronger. Um, how, uh, and finally, how did you think, um, how do you think your impact campaign with Through the Night moved the needle? Um, I know that you've raised, uh, raised funds, you've helped change, uh, policy that unlocked additional uh, funds, but how did it reframe what we know about care and the cost of it? Uh, in particular, women identified people and femmes who provide care. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll start kind of broad and work my way back. I think broadly, uh, in terms of the conversations that we were able to, I would say disrupt, um, there were conversations happening nationally uh, that didn't really include the voices of caregivers themselves um, and didn't include the voices of women of color. Uh, so to give you a concrete example, we were a part of a lot of different spaces, feminist spaces, human rights spaces, where the experts were all like, you know, they would see the film or they would see a clip and they were shocked um, at the fact that there was a 24 hour daycare center. Right. And so they didn't know. And this is their area of expertise, but they didn't know that 24 hour daycare ex centers exist. Wow. Because honestly, there are some gaps. Right. And and who is being, you know, who, who's at the proverbial table. Right. And what experiences are being centered or not. Um, and so in that way, I think we both um, helped to disrupt the space in terms of like, oh, wow, there are some voices that you all are missing that are really critical because guess what? These are the people that we now call essential workers that we now understand truly do the work that is necessary to keep everything else going. That's an understanding that I don't think we had in the same way before the pandemic. Um, I don't necessarily know that, you know, since then we are moving or acting in a different way, but we certainly know something now that we didn't know. And I think the film, was able to, you know, be part of that re-signifying and reframing, right, of 
who exactly does the work that is essential? Who, what do these people look like? What do they need? What do they offer? And, and what is their value? You know, what is their worth? Um, and, you know, these are like the people that in some ways are like hiding in plain sight, right? Because we all go to stores or if you're in like a New Yorker, for example, we're used to going to a store at midnight right? Well, if it's midnight, somebody's working there. I bet the people that are working there, some of those people have kids, you know, exactly. or their children. Um, these are the people that, again, we all depend on, but we take for granted um, and we sometimes uh, invisibilize. And the film, I think, helped to bring all of that to the forefront. Uh, I, I remember on panels, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, Nunu would say, it's great, you know, that we're, you know, in different cities across the country, clapping and banging pots for nurses and doctors and, you know, firefighters. Nobody ever mentions um, the child care providers or the home health aides, right, that provide care for the elderly. All these other, you know, um, categories of people who do work that is truly essential. Uh, I, I believe that the film was a part of sort of reframing and deepening our understanding of, of all of that. Yeah, thank you so much for that work. And I feel like the timing, you really seize the time with this film and, and the moment we were all in around the world um, uh, looking for, for care. Um, and uh, thank you. I would like to move uh, to you, Stanley, and play a clip of your much lauded film, The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution. Let's play the trailer. The Black Panthers. Black Panthers. Black Panther Party. Black Panther Movement. The Black Panthers were absolutely unique. Being black in America meant that you didn't walk down the street with the same sense of safety and the sense of privilege as a white person. Attack dogs, fire hoses. Police jump on you, beat you up, put the gun at your head. This is what we were going through on a daily basis. We stand on the eve of a black revolution, brothers. Now we have voices within the community that we're not going to continue to turn the other cheek. We want black power. We want black power. The Second Amendment guarantees the citizens a right to bear arms on public property. We're going to carry our guns and we're going to follow the police. We're going to maintain a legal distance, ready to throw down if necessary. Anyone who would approve of this kind of demonstration must be out of their mind. God help me, sir. That's what I need. These racist Gestapo fears have to stop brutalizing our community or we're going to drive them out. The majority of the rank and file are women. We tried to change some of the clear gender roles. Women had guns and men cooked breakfast for children. The way we walk and talk and dress, we were a phenomenon. The Black Panthers really understood the media. They used us to their advantage. Chairman of the Black Panther Party, and here he is. They tapped the phone. The phone is probably hooked up to the White House. You read the Black Panther Party newspaper? Yes, I do. Why? Because I am black and I'm proud. The FBI wanted to destroy the Panthers. How about justice? Justice is incidental to law and order. This was all out attack on the Black Panther Party. Every significant office is going to be raided, bombed, shot, mass arrests. They were coming to kill us. When the 15-minute gun battle was over, two Black Panthers were dead. This was obviously a political assassination. It was like a slaughterhouse. doing fundraisers at places like Jane Fonda's townhouse so that we could raise money for the legal defense fund. There were 156 not guilty verdicts. It's astonishing. We don't hate nobody because of their color. We hate oppression. We refer to ourselves as the vanguard. We wanted the entire community to follow. I feel free. I feel absolutely free. You understand? That's what I feel. So Stanley, you've directed and produced over 20 documentary films going back nearly four decades. Can you tell us about the first time you embarked on an impact campaign around one of your films and what motivated you to take on that work? 
Oh, Stanley, we can't hear you. Yeah, that, that's a great question. In um, like 2002 or so, we did a film, uh, The Murder of, of Emmett Till. And uh, we had a screening in Harlem, one of, our, one of our first screenings. And the crowd at the end of the film was so angry. They wanted to march down to Mississippi and burn the courtroom down where, you know, and, and um, we, we, we knew that, that going forward, we had to kind of uh, give something to the audience, something to do, something to think about. Um, and so we started handing out cards um, to, and they were addressed to the uh, Attorney General of Mississippi. And then mm -hmm. what the card said was, you know, um, we demand that you reopen the case. And we ended up passing out like 10,000 cards at different screenings, you know. Um, but we also, so that started us thinking about impact in a different way. And then we started thinking, uh, um, the, the film was made for American experience, right? And they were coming up with, with ideas like, you know, um, you know, we want to get you on the Larry King show and, and all these things. And, and we realized that Larry King didn't know who Emmett Till was. You know, Larry King, it meant nothing to him. And it, and and, and uh, American Experience really didn't understand the film, right? And that we understood the film. And so we said, okay, we have to kind of seize control in many ways of this impact campaign. And so we, we forced them to hire an African-American publicist, right? And we just kind of took it over. Um, we realized that, you know, it, it, it might not, uh, Emmett Till might not mean anything to Larry King, but it's cert uh, Emmett Till certainly meant something to Gwen Ifill, uh, you know, who, who was still alive and, and, and on PBS. And so uh, we, we targeted African-American uh, news people, African-American producers of the news and, and sent them you know, a request to be on the air and talk about the film. And so it was it was very successful. And, and we realized a lot of things from that, you know, from that campaign. And, and one of the things that I think that, that Lauda uh, was talking about is that, you know, one of the things is, is that the filmmakers are the best advocates for the film. So yeah. that, that you have to be involved as, as the filmmaker. Um, and that you have to start thinking about your impact and audience engagement early on. So early on, you know, as you're making the film and, and so many times, you know, filmmakers feel like they're, they're swamped just trying to make the film and they are, but you know, there's also, you know, hours in the day, you know, at night where you're going to, you know, like think about the impact and, and the audience engagement and, and, and the affinity groups, you know, um, so who are the the affinity groups for the film? Who 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 uh, will be your advocates for the film? Um, and and you know uh, and usually you have advocates, you know, for the film. So when we did um, the Black Panthers Vanguard of the Revolution, uh, you know, Bobby Rush, who was a, a former Black Panther leader, was in Congress, right? And he arranged for for us to screen the film, you know, before Congress. Um, so, you know, those kind of things, I think, are really important. But really, you know, I, I would just say that, you know, all filmmakers and, and everybody that, that you know, you are your best advocate, you know. And so many times as, as filmmakers, you know, we want to finish a film and we're like, okay, you know, but that's just the start, you know. I mean, if, if, if you make a film um, and nobody sees it, then, you know, what, what good is it? And I also think Lloyd hit on something that that's really important that you know that that you've got to make the film really good. So it doesn't matter, you know, you can have a great impact and an audience engagement campaign that you've thought of, but if the film is no good, you know, right. it it doesn't really pay off. So so one of the things about about filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, because you know it, it, you usually don't have a team of forty people, you know, but you 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 you're wearing a lot of hats. But you have to wear those hats and you have to wear those hats successfully. So it's not only making a really, really good film, as Lloyd said, but also, you know, having a really, really good uh, impact campaign and audience engagement. You know, for the, yeah. Black, Pan for the Black Panthers, which was a PBS film, um, we act, you know, so, you know, I say PBS because, you know, PBS doesn't have a lot of money. So at the end of the film, we, we were, you know, we didn't have any money for audience engagement and we had a Kickstarter campaign. 
you know, where we raised, I think, you know, I think we the floor was like 70,000 and we ended up raising like 92,000 or something like that. And that money was all for, the, that was after the film was done. And that money was all for the impact and, and the theatrical release of, of Black Panther's Vanguard of the Revolution. I love how you you speak about taking cues from, from the audience um, and how, you know, with the cards that you did with Emmett Till film, that that came about because of the audience response and them wanting something, they want to take action after being inspired um, with seeing your film. Um, in your in your film, The Black Panthers, one of the people in the film, um, Kathleen Cleaver, mother, law professor, and Black Panther Party member, in describing the Free Huey campaign, she seemed to also be describing what sounded like great indicators of a successful film impact campaign. In your film, she says, the people just turned out. They wanted to help us. They wanted to give us money. They wanted us to come speak. It was the gathering of connection to the Black Panthers that was different than before. With the Black Panthers having one of the most successful impact and engagement campaigns in the field, how did your impact strategy change the way people perceived the Black Panther movement? I, I think that that hopefully it it uh, changed, you know, kind of so many things about the Black Panthers. One of the reasons why we got into the film, you know, I was, you know, like a 15 year old kid when the Panthers came into being, right? And the Panthers that I knew were very different from uh, what came down in history, right? I, you know, I. You know, um, they they were thought of as kind of this violent militant group, but but there was another side of the Panthers, and I think that that the film and seeing the film it really changed everything um, in in many ways for for people's understanding of the Panthers. You know, they talked about the the Breakfast for Children program. They talked about the community action, the, the Panther Health program, and, and one of the things, you know, a couple of things, you know, that we talked about in the film that people didn't know. One that the Panthers were so young. You know, these were these were, you know, they were like 18, 19, 20. These were kids. And 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 that there were so many women that were a huge part of the Panther organization. One of the things that's said in the film is that, you know, by uh, you know, a 68, 69, um, more than half of the Panthers were women. You know, so 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 all of those I think they change the perception of the Panthers to, to uh, just you know some militant group running around with guns because you know they 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 um, kind of took advantage of that image you know I mean you know as one guy says in, in the film you know I saw a black I saw black people carrying guns and I said okay I want to be part of that I don't care what it is you know I want to be part of it. But that, and so they used that image, but also there was another side and a very serious side uh, of what the Black Panthers did. And, and hopefully uh, we changed um, the perception for many people. Yes, you certainly did. And I know Firelight Media has documentary lab fellows, which comprise of first and second year filmmakers, doc filmmakers. Uh, you all have thoughtfully built out these cohorts and teach about impact and engagement campaigns. What is Firelight's approach to teaching filmmakers about building an impact and engagement campaign? And the oh, question I, for both of you. Yeah, I, I can just say a, a quick thing and then you know let, let Lloyd talk. I mean, one of the things that we came upon early um, when we started the documentary lab, one of the first proposals that we got, I remember, was really a really great proposal. You know, and they were about to submit it, you know, to different people, but it had nothing about impact and engagement, you know, and it had to go out the next day. And we said, okay, let us help you just, just, just write, you know, a paragraph about impact and engagement to show that you're thinking about it, you know, right. and, and that, that, and that it's really important that, that the filmmakers think about it. Um, and so that's one of the things that, that, that we talk about. And then again, you know, finding the affinity groups. Um, you know, one of the things I do personally, you know, um, is, is, you know, if you ask me to do it, I do it. You know what I'm saying? Anybody, anywhere I can go talk about the film, show the film, you know, I, I you know, you know, uh, I'll be in, you know, Bob Davis's blog, anything, I, you know, anything I can do. But, but you know, in, in some ways, all, all publicity, you know, is, is good publicity. And 
uh, when we, we uh, came out with the, the Black Panthers, we were doing a screening and um, I, start, I started asking people as they came in, you know, where did you hear about the, this film? And everybody almost said something different. Mm. Everybody said something different, you know, so that, that we were reaching people in all different kinds of ways. And I think that's really important because, you know, the media landscape now is so diverse and so crazy, you know, that that you just, you know, you want to get people to see the film. You want to get people to talk about the film, you want to, you know, and because the films are a lasting document, right? You know, you know, I can go and find Through the Night and watch it today. I can go watch Black Panther's Vanguard of the Revolution today. And people are doing that. So the more people that you you know, engage, the more people that, that know about the film, the better. And Loida? Yeah, I'll just add um, that, you know, we, like Stanley just said, we always encourage folks to start thinking about um, impact and engagement. And really that just kind of, it's like asking filmmakers, what are your hopes? You know, what are your hopes and dreams for this film? Write that down, you know, hold that. Think of that, think about that as you are making the film. Think about it as you're, you know, creating relationships and partnerships with people to make the film. All of that, right? It's like a, it, there's like a cumulative effect, but you need to start thinking about it early um, so that you have enough to work with when you, you know, come to the end of the film and you may or may not be burnt down and out of money. But if you've been thinking about it along the way and building relationships, you, you have something to tap into and to, to work from. Um, that's one. The other is that, you know, at Firelight Media, one of our core ethos or, you know, beliefs is that it's really important for communities of color to tell their own stories. Um, and alongside that, for us, it's really important that we see communities of color as audiences for documentaries, for documentaries, right? And that we cultivate and nurture those audiences and the opportunities to see the films. You know, unfortunately, we know that the film festival circuit um, getting your film, uh, you know, on uh, on PBS or different networks doesn't necessarily mean that the film is going to reach the communities that it's about or that you made it for. And that is work that you have to take upon yourself, you know, because, you know, what, what good is it, right? You're making uh, films about, you know, Black communities and those films never reach the communities that they're about. You know, that, that that's not what we're, what we're going for here, right? And so, that is our responsibility, right? Because the industry and the field is still not completely reflective of the makeup of the United States. So we have to go above and beyond and do that work and you can't take anything for granted, right? Um, that's another huge thing that our communities do like documentaries. They do wanna see the films. We just gotta get them, you know, we just gotta get the films to them. Um, and then the other, you know, sort of main piece that we, we talk with filmmakers um, in terms of impact and engagement is that it's really critical to build partnerships uh, with people. Your job is to create a film, right? It's to create, whether you see that as a piece of art, right? It, it's a contribution to a particular conversation or social change movement, or whether you see your film as a tool. But regardless of you, if you call it art or you call it a tool, you're making a contribution um, to a community or on a particular social issue, there are other people already working on that issue that are connected to the very people that you want to see the film. So you have to build relationships and partnerships with those folks. Um, and that's exactly why we launched the Impact Campaign Fund, which is our current program at Firelight. It's a fund um, that every year we give out about five to seven grants uh, to um, documentary filmmakers of color that have gone through the lab, the documentary lab at Firelight Media to precisely do that work of creating a vision, creating a strategy, and then having the money to actually implement it um, because impact and engagement uh, funding and dollars, unfortunately, are, are not... Um, all that accessible, you know, these days. And so we we just kind of kept seeing filmmakers finish our other programs, get supported, and then they didn't have the funds to really, you know, do the work um, that they envisioned doing in terms of getting the films to their communities. So we saw that gap and launched the Impact Campaign Fund to try to meet that need. And we so greatly need that fund. And funders, if you're watching, please, please invest and continue to invest in impact campaigns. Thank you both, family, for your thoughtful 
responses and engagement today. It was so great to spend time with the both of you. And I wish you all the best on your next film projects and impact campaigns. People, please go do yourself a favor and watch Through the Night and the Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution. And I appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank you, Asad. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back for today's special Beyond Resilience Masterclass on producing films with impact. I'm so pleased to now be joined by Kevin, director Kevin Shaw, whose film Let the Little Light Shine had its POV debut this week, and his impact producer, Loxie Farrar. They are knee deep in impact execution, so I'm excited to check in with them both at this stage. Kevin Shaw, director, is a director, producer, and cinematographer who has created award-winning content for national television networks. Shaw was a segment director and cinematographer on America to Me, an additional cinematographer on City So Real, both from Oscar-nominated filmmaker Steve James. His debut documentary, The Street Stops Here, aired nationally on PBS and ESPN in 2010 to rave reviews. The following year, Shaw's Big Ten Network short documentary on a quadriplegic trying to regain the ability to walk won the Edward R. Murrow Awards for Sports Reporting Excellence. His latest film, Let the Little Light Shine, follows the fight to keep the National Teachers Academy, a top-ranked high-performing elementary school in Chicago, from closing. As the neighborhood that surrounds the NTA gentrifies, a wealthy parents group seeks to close the school and replace it with the high school campus. Loxy Farrar, Impact Producer, is a partner and director of social impact initiatives at Impact Media Partners. When serving as director of distribution, campaigns, and strategic partnerships at ITVS, she produced multiple high-level film education campaigns, including the PBS and Independent Lens flagship series, Half the Sky, A Path Appears, and TED Talks on PBS. She also contributed as head of impact at Level Forward, where she advised on mainstreaming, inclusion, and social impact into creative and business practices. Farrar was also an impact consultant for projects such as the Take Care Campaign, Holded Bias, and YouTube Originals film, Paper Children. Congrats on your national broadcast this week, both of you. Before we dive into where you are and where you're going, Let's play the trailer for Let the Little Light Shine. So many ugly things have been said about us, about our children, about our color, about our ability to learn. When that narrative becomes the reason why they should shut you down, then it becomes personal. Because now you're talking about my kids. Tonight, a proposal to convert an elementary school into a new high school is pitting parents against parents and parents against Chicago Public Schools. The school in question, the National Teachers Academy. A high-performing academic school. There's no question that a high school is needed for this area. Chicago, the South Loop, booming real estate, exploding population. The last thing we wanted to do was steal a school from somebody. This is about gentrification. This is about tailoring to wealthy middle-class folks versus low-income families. This whole thing is a sham. What do we take stands for? Things that we believe are right. This is the moment for me that I have to stand up. Starting today, we will be ignored no longer. Here they come! We're not going anywhere right now. We will fight for our school! You got to take your mind out of we don't have power and realize the power you have. It wasn't like they seemed angry. They seemed like focused, organized. I feel like you don't see what we see. We love our school. We love each other. We love everything that we built here together. We keep putting forth these valiant efforts, and we keep losing. 
This is not over with. Don't give up. We can all unite and be one and fight for what we think is right. Kevin, can you talk to me about whether you always wanted an impact campaign for this film? And do you remember the moment that you felt compelled to really embark on making it happen? All honesty, like back and forth, I was like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I, I want to do an impact campaign. I looked at, you look at all the work that I did previous to uh, bouncing into the social justice documentaries that I've done recently, um, I never did impact campaigns. Like we didn't do an impact campaign for the street stops here. Didn't do impact campaigns for some of the other work that I've done. <clears throat> it wasn't until I saw uh, America to me and the work that we did, the impact and engagement work that we did on that particular project, which involved going to 10 different cities across America, uh, <clears throat> engaging with audiences, with students, with educators uh, across the country. Uh, and I saw the uh, excitement that was involved in, in, in the responses that, that were coming from people who were really resonating with that project. I then saw the importance of what an impact campaign can do. That engagement is really important. And it's something that, you know, we uh, as documentarians who are doing this kind of social justice issue stories uh, should be thinking about trying to figure out how to do so. Um, it was that experience that made me say, okay, while I'm, while I'm putting together, let the little light shine, I need to be thinking about what's the impact going to be? Who, how am I going to continue to reach out to my target audience, which for me, you know, we're, we're youth, we're students, we're educators, and we're people who were, you know, teetering on the verge of becoming activists and figuring out how to do that, how to step in, into their power. And so... Um, you know, as we were making the movie, I always felt I wanted to do that. Uh, certainly didn't know how to do that. And, and that's why uh, I ended up, I was lucky to find somebody like Loxy who could help, help uh, guide the way for me. Yes. And I love that you are centering young people and, and parents and teachers in the impact campaign. Um, in the film, we get to see all of those groups working together. Um, Loxie, you've worked on some incredible impact campaigns over the years, including Coded Bias from Firelight's own Shalini Kantaya. Can you talk about how you tailor campaigns for each individual film, each individual film and team? And what are some of the broad questions you ask of film teams mm -hmm. to better understand how you might be able to better guide them? Oh, that's 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 a that's an excellent question. Um, and and just to give you context, um, I worked with um with Clo with coded bias kind of during its initial stages of building out a communications infrastructure for the campaign. And I mainly focused on early partnership building and um, uh, mobilizing advocacy groups and activists around algorithmic justice and um, apologies. Um, and also, she also hired even a bigger team for implementation. So, you know, it was really kind of a group effort at different phases where she was able to have me come on board. And then, you know, um, when time, some time passed, when the film was ready to be out there in audiences, a, a bigger team was brought on board. Um, but to answer your question, um, uh, working with filmmakers is very case by case and working with each project, as you know, is, is very case by case. And the way I am and, and, and working with impact media partners, we tailor campaigns um, basically dependent on many factors. But we begin this kind of exploratory process in partnership with filmmakers and the films team um, to ensure that we are also capturing what is most important to that team, right? And then how um, I or impact media partners together can help scale what's most important to them and enhance uh, through various, you know, campaign activities, different tactics. So together we go through this exploration where we identify the type of engagement we want to implement um, with the campaign. Um, who are the entities, for example, that could leverage the film for education and engagement purposes? 
And also who needs to see the film that would otherwise not, right? Who needs to see this film? Um, and are we trying to change behavior? Are we trying to change policy? Are we trying to change the culture in some way? Is there direct action perhaps that um, can elevate the campaign and mobilize people to do one thing, right? Um, the, or multiple things in, in many cases. Uh, though, as we know, like the market is saturated right now with a lot of amazing kind of social justice themed content. And sometimes when we're doing this exploratory process of figuring out what a campaign could look like, we also want to explore ways that the campaign can stand out. Um, how um, we can think outside the box in terms of camp, um, engaging audiences differently than they're used to. And basically this exploratory phase um, leads to refining goals, the tactics and, and the potential allies that could help formulate a campaign with goals and real setting real intentions for what you want to happen. And I've seen uh, you lead Brain Trust um, for Let the Little Light Shine, can you speak to to that process and why that was important mm -hmm. uh, for this impact campaign? Sure. Um, brain the brain trust we had a couple months before broadcast. Um, and a brain trust is absolutely I recommend it <laughs> to filmmakers um, and their team as being a really important engagement first step. Right. When you bring on board an impact producer or you bring on board a team to help kind of formulate an idea around a campaign, you, you can't really do that in a silo. Right. You need to integrate other different viewpoints and potential things that might come up, potential red flags, potential challenges, um, uh, different ideas that maybe the team in itself isn't thinking about. And the best way to do that is through a brain trust, gathering um, a group of intersectional partners, leaders, activists. Um, that are working in the case of little let the little light shine working to challenge gentrification um, teachers that are you know finding it challenging um, to work in environments where their school might be closing down and maybe a, a, a lower socioeconomic kind of um, a city or, or a place um, and we have a lot of really amazing experts, both academics, organizations, activists, and people also coming from the teachers union space, from education. And um, we were able to gather a lot of really amazing input. We already knew in the back, like, OK, we know what this film is about and what it could potentially do. The Brain Trust was really able, um, was really helpful for us to kind of be more nuanced in the kinds of audiences we wanted to reach out to and what was necessary and what kind of tactics do we need to do in order to reach those audiences and what kinds of resources will they be needing. A lot of the people who participate in the Brain Trust were also really excited to host their own kind of engagement activities around the film. Um, and we also had um, a few Brain Trust participants who were able to serve as advisors for um, the educational materials that we created, which we could talk about, I think, a little bit later. <laughs> yeah. And um, Kevin, I know that when you're creating an impact campaign, you're kind of world building, right? You're creating um, partners, partnerships, you're uh, building assets uh, to accompany the film and help the audience uh, have post-screening conversations and take action. Can you speak about some of the resources you have planned uh, for the film or in the, that are in the works that's going to be alongside the impact campaign activities? I think Loxie just kind of mentioned it. Um, one of the main things that we wanted to get out right before the broadcast was like our, <clears throat> our discussion guide and our organizer toolkit. And so these are leave behind items that people can download from our website and um, educators can use the discussion guide in classrooms. And, you know, I, I really want Loxie to talk about this in terms of all the detail and some of the things that we put in this with lesson plans and discussion topics, all based off of themes that go on in, in the film, when you're talking about the gentrification of, of uh, neighborhoods, when you're talking about how that affects education of neighborhoods and everything, it's it's really, really fascinating, some of the discussion topics that we have in this guide. And then we have this organizer toolkit as well that can um, speak to activists 
who are trying to step into their own power and fight not just necessarily gentrification, but whatever uh, issue is affecting their community right now. You know, there's one thing that we believe our film does. It kind of gives people a, a blueprint for what it looks like to step into activism. And, you know, that's kind of a scary thing for people who've never done it before. There's a, a lot mm -hmm. of courage that you have to have there. And the movie kind of states and shows how this particular group of parents did it. And this organizer toolkit supports all those themes that are that are there in the movie as well. So really excited about those two items that we just got done. And, and we really feel like those are going to be things that people can implement immediately and really continue the, con the conversation and engagement that that's uh, surrounding the film. Yeah, and in the film, we do get to see intergenerational community organizing at work in Chicago. Um, Loxie, as an impact producer, uh, you've witnessed a model of organizing where older adults mm -hmm. um, have to give up some of their control, right? So how do you see your impact campaign addressing leadership values? And um, how do you imagine your campaign resonating with young leaders um, and the adults that are in community with them? Well, you know, the film, I mean, um, you know, Kevin mentioned it's it's a, you know, blueprint. Some of the materials are kind of a blueprint, but the film in itself is a blueprint for how to organize. You know, it's a resource unto itself, step by step, how to mobilize people, how to engage in um, communication strategies, right? Um, uh, and how to deal with challenges and resilience, right? And and I think the showing the intergenerational um story is is very important because that, that's a narrative that you don't really see very much you know I and I think it's important that in order to make real change everyone needs to be involved right the community includes everyone every strata every kind of person every background um, of the community they need to have some kind of an input some kind of a say um the film in itself ha has amazing um potential uh for perhaps even screenings with with parents and and you know even older people and and students themselves to have a conversation about what it means uh to be active and an organizer in the 21st century and there's a lot of really important, um, exchange of knowledge that could happen as a result. For example, um, youth watching this film, they could really see themselves as um, a, a leader, right? Um, Elizabeth Greer, the the main you know organizer, the parent of the main film participant, she was incredible really at kind of organizing parents, teachers. But then when you see how the youth were organizing, they had their own ideas on how to talk about things, you know? So in terms of like older generations, there's great ways that they could help younger, younger generations to communicate. And in turn, younger generations could help older generations on how to communicate in a way that actually can reach out to youth, right? Um, youth are very savvy. Um, in using social media and other ways and they have their own language and how to communicate. So what I really see as um, potential here for bringing you know intergenerational audiences together, uh, but not only that, teachers, local government, a lot of different people, um, part of the community to, to have these intergenerational conversations and see where the gaps are in communication between these people, these groups of people, right? And how can they bring all the resources and all the knowledge that everyone has at any age to actually become a force to be reckoned with? And if I could just say one other quick thing, you know, it's been great with some of the things we've seen already, some of the screenings that we've done, you know, we've been able to take the movie to schools to universities, high schools, universities, speak directly with students, have the movie speak to them and uh, just see how it kind of resonates with them. You know, obviously, we, as you know, Assad with POV, we've been able to take the movie out to Fargo, North Dakota, and we took it out to two high schools there and we were able to talk to some Black, Brown and Indigenous students in particular in those communities there who, um, you know, saw themselves and saw some of the issues that they're dealing with there in Fargo uh, in the movie. And, you know, to have that opportunity to not only show the film, but then talk to them directly and listen to them and kind of think about strategies and, and let them know that they're not alone 
is, is what impact is all about in my, in my uh, definition of it. You know, another thing that we've done recently, uh, we, we screened the movie with a, um, a, a teacher's class university um, here in Loyola, uh, Chicago. And this is a class that, uh, of, of students who are learning how to become elementary school teachers. And so they definitely you know, felt the film and saw some of these challenges that uh, a teacher might have when they might um, not necessarily agree with what the status quo of their bosses are and, and, and kind of don't want to go with the company line there as, as many of the NTA educators, um, you know, felt, felt obligated not to fall in that line as well. So, um, you know, that partnership there now, um, there's a partnership that is in that, that has become uh, apparent between NTA and this Loyola university where some of these teachers now may have an opportunity to go visit NTA, might and be able to get placed at NTA and, and do work uh, directly with the community, you know? And so to me, that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have, you know, this impact campaign, if we didn't have these tools in place to try to give, um, you know, communities an opportunity to really see themselves and, and feel uh, uplifted and be able to do work that is crucial to them. Yes, and I was a former fourth grade teacher in Atlanta, Georgia, and I would have loved to have seen a documentary like this going into the classroom. And I love that you all are supporting future generations of of teachers that are entering that space. Um, I I wanted to um, well, two things. One, I wanted to highlight that we've already we've incorporated the ITVS Doc Skill Survey tool, and we've already been getting feedback that says this film is shifting how people are thinking about their own power to get involved with their school boards and their PTAs and also engaging the children around them, their own children or nieces and nephews um, in conversations about how they feel about their school experience. What are some things that they do want to shift and change? So you already are changing some hearts and minds um, as it relates to education. Um, I, I did want to pivot to the film's website. You all have an incredible website and you have links for visitors to purchase tickets to private screenings. Uh, can you tell filmmakers who are tuning in about, uh, who are hoping to build their impact campaigns um, about why it's crucial to have revenue generating opportunities and how you thought about uh, charging for these screenings? Uh, could you speak a little bit about that? I mean, I just think for me, in all honesty, it's about following the lead of, of people who have kind of set the table of, of things that you need to do, you know. So I was a, a, a Firelight uh, Media documentary fellow, and, and we talked about impact and engagement. And these were kind of the things that we discussed, you know, about having screening opportunities uh, for people to request screenings. or You know, at the time, you might have even requested a DVD. Nobody really does that anymore, per se, but they have an opportunity to press your screening. You could you could send a link to, to folks and, and um, you know, charge a, a nominal amount for that. I, I think about some of the lessons I learned from some of the other great impact producers that are out here in the business, like like Annie uh, Mercedes and, and Looky Looky Pictures. And, and, you know, that's something that she had mentioned about having this, this type of opportunity available for folks. So, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to do that too, I guess. <laughs> I don't exactly know how it's all going to work out, but, um, you know, we're going to have this opportunity for people to request the screenings. Um, sometimes, you know, we negotiate a, a screening fee um, for for our film and and you know to be all uh, you know to be totally honest with with what those fees can be they can range anywhere from like three hundred to five hundred dollars um, that's what we've been charging at least um, and then sometimes um, depending on on who's asking um, they might not have that amount and so we negotiate and sometimes I've done it just for free you know based off of whoever it is you know. I think the opportunity of having that screening button and uh, on your website and when somebody clicks onto it and they have an opportunity to fill out their information and talk about where they're coming from, well, then that gives us an opportunity to engage with that community and see and learn about them, learn about their story and learn about how 
you know, our film can be a, be a tool for them. Because ultimately, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to provide the movie so that can be an educational tool for people, uh, not only entertaining, but it can, it can serve them in some way. And um, so, you know, that, that's kind of the things that, that we've done. And we've had a lot of success. All of our, all those screenings that, that I mentioned beforehand came through, you know, that, that, that button on, on the website. And we've, we've, um, we get a bunch every week. And, um, you know, we're, we're very, very happy with, with that feedback so far. That's beautiful and, and super helpful. Um, I know it's not always something we talk about in this space about the finances and the money that it takes to put on a campaign and to, to do your work. So I appreciate you sharing those details. Um, I want to bring in some audience questions right now. Uh, so this is a question that came in uh, for both of you. Um, someone said, I'm struggling with balancing storytelling with characters I become attached to without crossing lines. In other words, it is tempting to have impact in their lives now before the film is even finished. Have any of you faced this dilemma? That's more of your filmmaker kind of question, Kevin. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it, um, it, it's a hard question to answer, but mm -hmm. I also think that, um, you know, we as filmmakers, we're, we're human beings and we're dealing with people who are human beings and, and um you know, if you feel like um, you're in a space where you should be helping somebody out who might be in some struggles, then, um, you know, you should do what your heart tells you to do. You know, you should be a human being first and not like a, a filmmaker who's trying to get a story. You know, I, I would say that the closest thing that I had uh, to this kind of scenario was w with America to Me and you know, one of the families that I was uh, following uh, had some really hard times. If you watch that series you might be able to know who that is um and there was an opportunity where you feel like uh it's it's a super compelling a dramatic part of theirs of of this person's story but it's also like uh, the lowest part of, of of their life right now you know they're going through a, a real hardship and um you know my my attitude was to back away to to not film and to try to be of of help for them because um, that's just what my heart was telling me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the family appreciated that at the end of the day, and it didn't really um, hurt or affect the, the, the entire series or, or the film in any fashion that, uh, that way either. You know, it's not like we missed something dramatically. Uh, I, I just had a better feeling about myself and my ethic, ethics and, and moral value when it comes to documentary storytelling. Um, now I didn't want to be exploitative. And so I, I feel like your heart should tell you how to, how to, uh, move in that particular instance. And for me, that's how I moved. It'll be up to, you know, you, I guess, to kind of decide that for, yeah. for, for you as well. And, you know, just to piggyback on that, I have been brought on board for certain projects that, um, after filming, not during the filming process, but after, you know, the, the primary, you know, filming process um, where filmmakers um, had some of their film subjects that were experiencing a lot of PTSD from situations that were happening in their own lives. And that's what the documentary was about. And um, we did establish in this particular case, a care plan for these three young women um, who needed um, who needed therapy, who needed some counseling, um, who needed um, also help and support on how to apply for college, things like that, you know, providing them with resources and, and support. And we did a lot of that with this incredible um, or, um, agency, um, actually, um, in Texas, where they were worked, worked in partnership and we provided an honoraria for, for their support to work in partnership with the films team and myself to, to develop a care plan because, you know, um, when when filming is is done and you know a lot of your film subjects are still going through a lot of the exact exact same things and even possibly even things are getting worse you know um that you know filmmakers like kevin and the filmmakers i worked with 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 this project they they felt a responsibility um to help you know to be part of uh, providing them with resources, um, providing them with connections, you know, providing them with um, support and help. So, I mean, I, 
I am all for also the impact campaigns, including some kind of component that allows for support or allowing for the budget for the impact campaign to also have a certain kind of vertical that helps, um, continues to help and support for a certain amount of time um, or longer uh, the film subjects, especially um, if they are, you know, falling through hard times or, or need uh, mental health support and resources. So, I mean, I'm all for that too. And, and that's something that I think is really important and should be part of an impact campaign. For sure. Yeah, yeah, and let a little light shine. You know, we had the educators. They put their they were putting their jobs on the on the line. Specifically, mm -hmm. the principal of our film, uh, Isaac Castellas, and that's well documented in the movie what the risks were. And and so you know, we had started to think about okay, well, whether it be our impact campaign or or in our film budget, do we need to provide legal services for them for Isaac for his team? if they get terminated uh, unfairly because we're filming in, in the school and the district doesn't like it or, or what have you. So, you know, we had, we had these conversations of like, yeah, we're gonna support our participants as much as, as possible because they're, they've sitting out here and, you know, given their lives and given their opportunities up here to tell their story. And, and some of that, sometimes that comes with great risk. So, we as filmmakers need to be able to sit there and, and, and support them in every possible way. Right. Yeah. That protagonist care is so important and being thoughtful and creative about how you can show care um, is, is critical. Um, what are some tips for another question that came in? Um, this question is, what are some tips uh, about finding and developing impact campaigns and trusting that they will succeed? Do you want me to, Kevin, do you want me to start or do you want to start? No, you go ahead and start. Yeah, uh, I have some, but you go ahead and start. <laughs> um, you know, we, we have situations sometimes where filmmakers are do, you know, they're running their own impact campaigns or they're doing it themselves, you know, um, and, and need resources and support. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, filmmakers, they go to the impact field guide and toolkit, you know, that's online that um, provides a really good primer on how to start, how to think about what kind of impact campaign you need. And, you know, oftentimes it does come down to budget, you know, like in terms of, you know, and money, you know, it does in terms of, you know, um, the kind of support or expertise that you may need uh, as a filmmaker team to um, to help kind of bring about some of these ideas and perhaps start implementing them. Um, you know, I, I always recommend when filmmakers are doing their own impact campaigns and relying on their own films team to implement that, that, you know, they rely on the resources that are already out there in existence, um, relying on your own kind of filmmaking world to have conversations about how other filmmakers have done things um and and also you know potentially looking for ways to fundraise specifically for for um doing an impact campaign right um and having kind of a plan in place so that you can um share that plan with potential funders is is incredibly important um, and then sometimes when, you know, our filmmakers have money maybe to hire someone, they could hire someone for a short phase, you know, and then hire, you know, at a different phase, you know, later on. There are ways, you know, to work around maybe the, the money situation, which is always comes down to that. Um, but rely on the resources that you already have. For example, you know, Firelight has incredible resources and incredible impact producers that they have helped cultivate, you know, their expertise. Um, and um, there are a lot of, thankfully, impact producers out there on a variety of expertise and levels that could help support even preliminary thinking of what an impact campaign could look like. And then a filmmaker goes and makes it happen. Right. So there's a lot of different ways that a filmmaker go, can go around doing this. It's just a matter of resources, capacity. And, you know, if this filmmaker also has, you know, kind of that know how or that expertise already and wants to do things themselves or want to bring people on board to help help cultivate what the campaign looks like and also implement. Yeah, I would uh, I'd second all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would say, look into your network, you know, um, the way that Loxie and I connected, I had a person who was working as a social media strategist for a short time. Her name is Megan Adele Lopez. She worked on Coded Bias. Um, she basically introduced me to Loxie. 
And from there, we connected. And, you know, not only did Megan introduce me to Loxy, she ended up introducing me to my my graphics uh, branding artist. What, what would you call Pablo Moderno, uh, Loxy, besides just, just the goat of, of all this stuff? You know what I mean? Like, he is a talented individual. But, you know, I wouldn't have met either one of those folks if I didn't get that referral from, from uh, Megan. And so it's like... You cultivate your network, mm-hmm. cultivate your network of, of, of people. Uh, you know, impact campaign work for a filmmaker is hard, man. Like that, this is like a 24 hour. It's, it's just as hard as making the film. And so like, all honesty, I didn't want to take that on. Like I did not want to do it all by myself. I just couldn't do it um, because I also want to make other movies, right? We're filmmakers. We want to make films. We want to continue to get new stories out there, things of that nature. And it's hard to uh, try to do that and then put all that effort into doing an impact campaign as well. So for me, it was important to try to raise some money to uh, hire somebody to kind of handle that, especially with me, because I'm green on it. I don't know. I don't know what a brain trust is at this time. You know, I don't know any of the terminology, any of that stuff. I'm totally green on, on everything. So I'm learning all of it. I'm being a sponge at the same time. So I need experts. I need people who know this better than me and can um, take what little things I know and things that I'd like to see and really, you know, translate that and make that into uh, make that vision into a reality. And for me, that was Loxy. And, you know, which, again, full disclosure, we haven't been working uh, 10 months straight together, we've been working in the piecemeal, as, as Loxie had talked about, in pieces. Like, you you don't need to have this $100,000 to get the impact campaign at the end of your movie and feel like you're rolling. You can work, um, you know, in piecemeal strategies. And so, like, that's what we kind of did. Like, we had a, a couple months where we worked together and we really worked on, you know, what could an impact campaign look like? If we were able to raise you know, a large amount of money, what would be our dream goals of, of, of how a campaign would function, you know, and that would be this spark campaign that we've come up with where we're, you know, having kind of lectures with film participants in communities where uh, we're really u- utilizing the film as a tool and we're showing how people can organize and be activists and et cetera. But if we don't have all that money, well, what else can we do? You know, and that gets down to, okay, having the brain trust and then it gets down to having the discussion guide and the organizer toolkit so that, you know, you're still leaving behind stuff for a community that that needs it, that wants it, that's hungry for the information and wants to feel inspired and uplifted. So, you know, don't feel like you have to have, you know, this this boatload of money to then go ahead and, and push forward with some sort of campaign. You can do it in piecemeal with, with an expert. There's a ton of resources that Loxy talked about that you can uh, utilize and, and figure things out on yourself. But you know, the number one thing, too, I think is just look into your network. This is a relationship business. You don't know who's going to know who and who you're going to get introduced to that can help you, you know, reach your goals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you all have shared some excellent tips and gave us context of how you built your impact campaign. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Congratulations again on the nationwide broadcast of Let the Little Light Shine. You can still catch the film on pbs.org or you can download the PBS app where the film will be available to stream through March 10th, 2023. Thank you both. Thank you, Saad. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for a special Beyond Resilience Masterclass on producing films with impact. We're back with filmmaker Nosheen Dadaboy and Abir Kawaz, who are here to discuss the important impact work on Nosheen's film and act of worship, which had its debut on POV in October of this year. So I want to read their bios. Nosheen Dadaboy is a Pakistani-American director and cinematographer whose work spans fiction and documentary. Her films have screened at festivals worldwide, including Sundance, TIFF, Tribeca, Lacorna, and have appeared on Netflix, Amazon, HBO, and PBS. 
In 2014, she had a directorial debut with The Ground Beneath Their Feet, which premiered at IDFA. Her most recent project, An Act of Worship, explores the past 30 years of American history through the perspective of Muslims across the U.S. who have lived it. Observational footage of activists who came of age after 9-11, along with intimate testimonials, offer a window into the community's perspective on pivotal moments and policies that continue to impact Muslim Americans today. Abir Kawaz, impact producer, is a Palestinian-American community organizer from Brooklyn, New York. She has been working with Arab and Muslim communities in New York City around policy issues such as immigration reform, unlawful policing and surveillance, as well as advocating against Islamophobia. Abir served as the New York City advocacy specialist with the campaign to take on hate under the National Network of Arab American Communities, transitioning from her position as advocacy director at the Arab American Association of New York. Currently, she has relocated to Johannesburg, South Africa, to complete an MA focused on Islamic liberation theology. In an act of worship, Kawas was both a film participant and its impact producer. Welcome to both of you. Your POV broadcast was just over two months ago, so I'm excited to hear all about the impact you and your team have made thus far. However, before we do so, let's play the trailer for an act of worship. Hi, so I'm gonna quickly just play some random piece of music over here and hope it goes well. See how it goes, okay? It's just gonna be so bad. My dad used to sit on the edge of my bed every night and recite a prayer of protection over my sister and I. My parents got calls telling them, your children will be next. That experience taught them to keep their religion and culture hidden. In the first day of class, the teacher made me stand up and tell people what it's like to be Iraqi. Like I was like this specimen, like this alien. Farouk, what a weird name. I don't know why your parents named you that. You should be Jimmy. We're gonna call you Jimmy. I had something inside of me being like, I don't know who I am. I have to scream louder. I'm black, I'm Muslim, I'm here in order to be heard. It took years to rediscover that assertive, bold person. Every day, I choose that path of resistance. So Abir, as both a film participant and also the film's impact producer, you had a crucial and a bit of an uncommon stake in the film's rollout. How did that decision come about and how do you think the impact campaign benefited from your dual role? Um, thanks for the question, Asad, and thanks for having uh, me and Noshin on this call today. Uh, so how did I become impact producer for an act of worship as I am also a subject in the film? Uh, well, pretty unconventional, I would say. Um, but although it was unconventional, I also think it was a natural progression um, that reflects a lot about how the film was made. Although I'm a subject in the film, I'm actually one, one of many, and the film is has been made communally. So it's, it's made with all of these community testimonials, but also community videos. And so for myself, my relationship with the film is not that I'm just a subject in this film and it's like this external media project uh, for me, but I actually felt like this was a film for the community that was going to open up many discussions about the community. And then secondly, the film is about the subject matter that I was doing community organizing around. I mean, the film is about Islamophobia. The film uh, talks about specific policies that I was doing work around, for example, like CDE work, um, the Countering Violent Extremism um, program, like, you know, us doing work around that within the New York community, but within the national community of, of trying to, to um, stop communities from engaging with that program. So the film was a natural, like, it. I had a personal stake in it. It was part of the work that I was doing. And then when the impact campaign was rolling out after we premiered at Tribeca, 
you know, I was already in communication with Noshin, kind of being like, oh, we should do this event or we should do that, you know, because uh, I think myself and then the other participants in the film, Amina and Hadija, were excited about the rollout for the film. Um, we're all people who work within the community. We are dedicated to holding community conversations and and we also all have the skill set to pull off community events because that's the work that we do. And so when we were thinking about the campaign, I initially entered as kind of just helping to with the vision, giving in, uh, input on the vision of the campaign. But when um, Noshin actually needed to hire someone, it kind of was just perfectly placed of her reaching out and saying, hey, are you available for this? And I was like, well, this is great. I get to do hold community conversations around the country. I know how to logistically plan these conversations. I get to hang out with Noshin, but also I get to speak about the subject matter of the film, which I'm included in, but it's also, you know, part of that greater world that I've always um, been working uh, with and, and the greater community that I've been working with. I'm so glad you took on the role. Um, it makes perfect sense. Um, Noshin, part of what your film aim aims to do is lay bare the experiences that Muslims have had to navigate over the last 30 years and how American media and politics continues to make Muslims community is a target of hatred. Now, can you talk to me about your team's intentional decision not to reframe those hateful notions of Muslims for a broader audience, and instead you focused on the Muslim community and engaging them uh, around the film? Can you speak about that? Um, yeah, I, I just also want to say thanks so much for having us, and it's really nice to be in conversation with you about it. I. I don't know how many Zoom calls can be all Muslims talking about a Muslim film. Um, so that's cool. Um, but I think like, I think um, understanding who the audience was, was, um, was a little bit a part of the journey of making the film as well. Initially, when we started it, we um, were thinking about, you know, uh, I, I, my sister, we used to work as an attorney for the Council on American Islamic Relations. And, you know, right after the election, I, she had already left care, but I, I knew that people like her were going to be very busy under the Trump administration. So it was like, you know, wa wanting to really follow like the journey of like, what is it going to be like for or organizers and activists? Um, but not really thinking about like, who are we talking to when we're telling that story? And in the process of making the film um, and understanding, like, you know, even a lot of people in the Muslim community were, myself included, like a lot of us were very shocked when the ban happened. But I think, you know, many people, especially organizers, like knew none of this is new. Like this has been happening for a long time. And for me, like I was, I wasn't an organizer, but I was like, this is has been a part of my lived experience. And um, but when we were going out and speaking to people, a lot of a lot of folks that we talked to within the community kind of didn't know, like, oh, if I'm I grew up in California, and the people in California didn't know like how bad it was after 9/11 in New York, for instance. And you know, we were all having these like separate experiences. And so I think the film was really a way for us to kind of talk to each other and share like this is what was happening to us and also a way to acknowledge that there had been so much trauma done to the community and um i think just as a way to of self-preservation we weren't talking about it and we weren't dealing with it and acknowledging it and so the film was really about making something for our, our community to just understand what had happened to us and um yeah i think i i think that there are people outside of the community that are getting something out of the film and that's what we've heard but that's sort of a bonus <laughs> that wasn't the intent i love it um the for us bias model and um and thank you for for making this incredible film uh, i want to switch gears a little bit and um speak about fundraising which um is something that a lot of filmmakers tuning in are are thinking about. Um, can you speak about what was your budget and how did you have um, how did you have to work within your budget um, to help you achieve some of the goals in your campaign? Yeah, um, 
So the budget for the impact campaign, I think is in like, it's somewhere around like 450K. That's like the dream budget. We have not raised that much money. <laughs> but that's a, if we got that much money, we would be able to do all the things that we we're hoping and dreaming to do. Um, and for fundraising for that, um, a lot of it was going back to, uh, it's very similar to how we fundraised for the film. And so part of it was going back to people that supported the film, um, you know, so the Ford Foundation, the Perspective Fund, Firelight Media, all of these uh, people were partners that we went back to and, you know, were able to, to fundraise for the impact campaign with that and um, with their support. And then, you know, the other um, part of it was also going back to those partners and telling them, this is what we're doing. Are there other people that, you know, you can help us reach out to? And so, you know, for instance, like Chicken and Egg, who don't do impact, were able to connect us with people who are interested in supporting our impact campaign. Um, and so a lot of it is uh, just being in communication with with the people that are supporting you and just saying like, hey, hey, here's the thing that I need. And you just don't know, you know, what resources are available to you sometimes. Um, but we, you know, not again, dissimilar to raising money for a film, you're kind of doing it in, in chunks. And so it was like, here's this much money that we've raised and then kind of figuring out what are the, what are the phases of the impact campaign that we can roll out with this amount of money and I'll let Abir um, answer the rest of this question. Yeah, so as you know, Sheen kind of did most of the work and some other producers in the film did the work of raising the, the money, you know, in terms of the execution of the impact campaign, I was working more on that side. And for us, just as you know, Sheen said, because the money is like, has been coming in bits and chunks and hopefully is continually coming in for us, um, the impact campaign is based on phases. And so the first phase, we, we, we kind of gave ourselves an estimate amount. You know, I think we, we like, you know, we kept it within like 30K or something. Then we said, what can we do? How many cities can we reach within that um, budget? How, like, you know, what is the time period that it would take? And there was a lot of testing out. I mean, we initially held large community screenings. We would go and rent out theaters. And theaters are expensive to rent out. And I think over time, you know, as we learned that there was something that was really beautiful about people seeing themselves on the big screen and also seeing the film in community. Once the film also was broadcasting, we, I think, learned that people can engage the film in different ways. And um, we also were beta testing a lot of the workshops that we wanted to hold with the community through this first phase of the campaign. And now in the second phase, I think that we've learned, you know, that we want to kind of maybe hold more smaller scale events, but more uh, focused and uh, I think invest more of the budget into the facilitators uh, and the community spaces that we're going to be using for those events. So the the budget kind of has been impacting how we've been building the campaign, but it's also allowed us to, to take time to learn from the first phase as we're trying to like build out and execute the second phase and hopefully continue onward after that. Yeah, I love that you all are um, evolving the campaign and allowing it to, to teach you some things along the way. Um, can either of you speak to me about why having your film on public media was important to you and how you're working with us, um, uh, with POV rather, to further your impact? Um, yeah, can you speak to that? I mean, I think uh, obviously like having the film just out there and accessible, that's like the biggest question is like, how can I see it? And you're like, watch the broadcast or, you know, go stream it on POV. And so that was huge. Um, you know, like any, I think any filmmaker knows like how much just having distribution is um, you know, like really the toughest part of maybe making a film. Um, so having, having that was great. And I also think like, you know, um, the vast amount of viewership that we you know like people that we talk to who are watching pov every day are also sometimes not people from our community and a lot of it is you know middle america or non-muslim america and so that was a way that we could sort of alleviate the burden of like how are we getting the film out to like a broader audience which we never were 
that was never our focus, but I think it was nice to say like the film is out there and accessible to so many people. Um, but then, you know, as we were doing community screenings to be able to tell people like, hey, like tell your friends and and then we would have people that were, you know, streaming in and getting back to us. So that, you know, just the the accessibility of that I think was was amazing. And then, you know, the um, on top of that, while we were rolling out the campaign, there were just so many educators that were reaching out to us and we were like, great, like we have, there's, um, you know, like a whole educational component that POV is putting together. And so you can take this kit, this film and like show it to kids that are in like, you know, grade six through 12 and there's a discussion guide. So maybe we don't have the resources to come to uh, go out to every community, but here's a discussion guide and you can host the screening and have a discussion. And, um, you know, and then of course, like colleges and so many people have been reaching out to us in that space. And then it's a huge lift for us to be able to say, we have a partner that's doing this and we don't have to, you know, we don't have to do every, every piece of it because it, it's already, it was already a huge lift for what we did do. Yeah, um, I, it's been it's been a joy to to work on this film. Um, Nasheen, you know that um, how much this film touched me and just made me feel affirmed as a Black queer Muslim of immigrant parents. I've been born and raised in in New York City, and although we've been in a few conversations, I still felt compelled to write and thank you on the night of broadcast. Um, and it was like the third or fourth time I've seen the film, but it was just, it, it just touches me every time. And um, when you could see your, yourself and your community on screen, um, there's just something so indescribable about um, that kind of affirmation and um, that kind of visibility. Um, so we, sometimes we do find ourselves in these moments where the personal is not only political, but also professional. So I know this film was very personal to you. Can you talk about what it's like as a director to not just be intimately involved with the film's themes itself, uh, but also uh, be on the team guiding the, the impact vision as well, um, alongside of there? Um, and do you think more directors should try their hands at juggling both? Um, the short answer to the last part of your question is maybe no. <laughs> only because I'm so tired <laughs> um yep. and when my my friends my other friends that ha, you know have done like campaigns like CJ Hunt had his film on POV and he was like man I'm so tired and I'm like I was like getting ready to release my film and I'm like I'm never gonna be tired and now I'm like CJ you were right I'm tired <laughs> um but you know I think um I I've I've talked about this a little bit when we've been showing the film and doing Q and A's, uh, it was really hard for me, I think, to even um, acknowledge for myself how personal the film was, even though, you know, part of my story is in the film, my sister is relaying, you know, something that happened to us as kids in the film. Um, and it was really in post that I started to, to kind of acknowledge like, yeah, I, a lot of the things that everyone else is talking about are things that impacted me as well. And when I talk about our community not acknowledging their trauma, I'm also talking about myself. And I think understanding that um, was really helpful to then understanding, okay, if I was the person that I was going out to with this film, what would I need out of it? And, you know, what are the, the tools that I think then we can give to our community to empower them um, if, you know, as they're watching the film and engaging with our campaign. And I think I, uh, I just got so much from understanding storytelling and understanding, like, this is a story that was told about you, but it's not your story. And so how can we then give our community the tools to understand those things. And, and then the other, you know, big component of the film was um, interviewing people from our community and just, you know, sitting with people and listening to their story and having them feel like that was important, like their story was important. Um, and, you know, like you said, like their, their, their home videos and all of those things are, are, are an important part of like our history. 
And and so the the campaign w- was about one storytelling workshops to get people to um, understand what their narrative is, you know, acknowledging the trauma, but also outside of the frame of that trauma, and then to give them tools to go into their community and then interview community members and, um, you know, think about like how they can start collecting an archive and, and really just saying like, your story is important. And this big, you know, story that it has been told about us isn't really, isn't really our story. And, and those were things that I needed. And then they were things that we were able to build into the campaign. Thank you. Um, I want to transition into some audience questions. Um, Abir, um, this question is for you. Can you talk about some specific and engagement goals you have set for your film's campaign and how you measure them? Sure. Um, so the the specific goals that we envisioned for the campaign was to uh, firstly, we wanted to reach out to localities that really needed to see themselves and really needed to like to see themselves on film, to see themselves represented. And so while we we wanted to go to like, you know, places like Dearborn, Michigan or New York that had like a large Muslim community, we also wanted to go to communities that did not have like a, a very large Muslim community or a lot of support so that we could, you know, bring in those conversations into those communities. Uh, we also wanted to hold community screenings and it was a really important element to ha- have people see the film, you know, kind of on a big screen so that they can see it like properly with the right visuals, the right sound, but also with, amongst each other so that people could hear the laughs together so that, you know, we can kind of see, well, what made this community cry? And it, re- it really looked different in different places. Some some people would laugh at certain things in certain cities. Some cities, like, I don't know why they didn't think these certain things were funny. And then the, the, the moments where people cried. So just learning from that. And then, of course, we had our workshops. So we had three workshops that we wanted to do. Um, one was about challenging your personal narrative. Um, the second was about creating the personal archives, uh, like Noshino was explaining. And then the third was, you know, uh, mental health workshops to allow people to process the film and 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 really like think about their mental health and how the events of the film have affected their mental health. So for us, we were able to execute these things in the different cities, but we also, you know, we had some things that we learned along the way. Like for example, could you have people watch a film for two hours and then have a workshop right after that film? You know, sometimes it was a matter of thinking about, okay, maybe this, like, you know, um, we can't, this is, this will take too long. Or actually this venue, like having it in a theater does not actually allow for an intimate conversation afterwards. So we have been learning a lot about just trying to find the perfect combination of like space and timing um, to be able to like continue the impact of the, uh, or the goals of the campaign. Because I think that we really found that, um, the mental health conversations, especially in allowing people to to share their stories, was just extremely crucial to the experience of people, you know, c- coming out of the film and, and and engaging with it. And so we're thinking more now about how to have smaller scale and more focused events that will allow uh, for people to have a reflective space um, for themselves after seeing the film. And w- we have to make some decisions of whether the film will actually be paired with the conversations around the film or not. And each space will allow us a different opportunity, I think. Can I uh, just add to that question, that answer that like um, our our sort of most successful event, at least how we perceived it based on interactions was, was this long day of having the film screening and then doing a workshop. But I think the two things that made that event um, stand out was that we had the screening at the Arab American Museum in Dearborn. And so it was just very focused in terms of like who we are trying to bring into this space. And then we had brought in the partner of the Muslim Wellness Foundation and Dr. Camila Rashad held um, a mental health workshop after the screening for, obviously it was voluntary, like we didn't lock people in the theater for whoever wanted to stay. and. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that between the the focus of the event and, you know, where we had it and who we were bringing in and having this community partner who was al- also deeply invested in um, 
and what we were trying to do within that space, I think made that like really, I think for both of us, it was the highlight of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shout out to Dr. Rashad as well. She is such a uh, uh, important resource in our community and sparking these conversations about mental health in the doc field. Um, another question that came in is, uh, how do you balance impact work for your film and making a living as an artist? So I guess both of you may be able to answer <laughs> artist or activist. Um, I feel like Nosheen really struggled with this. <laughs> <laughs> we had, I mean, we are lucky that we did receive funding for the campaign, um, but it was like, a, a, it's sort of the challenge that you have when you're making a film where you're like, okay, we re received this amount of money, but maybe we need to hire, you know, an impact producer or a social media manager or, you know, other people in order to execute something. And 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 I think a lot of directors will probably um, know what it's like when you're like, I, I, I raised this money and now I'm going to hire an editor or I'm going to hire a cinematographer and maybe I'm not going to be on the payroll. <laughs> um, and and so, you know, we I had I knew that I wanted to make time to do this. And so a lot of it was working up until the campaign started, finding days where I could shoot in between and, um, you know, again, like supporting myself through other means in order, in order to do the campaign. And, um, and like I, I said earlier, I am, I am dealing with a certain level of exhaustion, not just in terms of, um, you know, doing both of these things, but also uh, in terms of, you know, it's been six years, and I am very, proud of this film and I'm really excited about the kind of engagement that we've had with the community and what I hope we continue to have but now I'm like I've really been telling a beer like I'm gonna pass the baton like this I, I want this to be you now and I, I I also as a creative person just need to expend some energy on a different project now and um, yeah and I think like probably everybody will have different levels of of what kind of I, like I I will say it was very meaningful for me to have the community to be in those spaces where the community conversations were happening because otherwise you know you could make a film and it just goes out into the world and and you don't really know what you did and and so it was very meaningful to to see it you know to see people engage with it to feel like the six years of <laughs> the challenge of making it was worth it. Like, I'm really happy I did that. Um, but it, you know, it's like, I'm, my, my cup is full now <laughs> and I need to like go and and do something else. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I'm wishing you rest um, as, as we move into 2023. Um, and Abir, do you think you will be in this, um, impact space in this way, engaging with film? Like how does this differ from some of your other activism work? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's been a great uh, one advantage for the film, but also a great opportunity for me that um, the film was able to take someone who was a subject of the film and then allow them to kind of take on this work. Uh, for myself, when I first started engaging with this work, I thought, well, this is like a realm that I'm unfamiliar with. This is like media. And I never worked with media or film. Um, but one, I learned uh, as an as an organizer that film and art is just like an extremely evocative tool to use uh, to create community conversation and and get emotion out of people. And with this campaign, I've had some of the the best kind of most intimate um, community conversations that I've had, even like within my career as an organizer doing, you know, town halls, et cetera, you know, so I think that I've learned that film is a really amazing tool. And, you know, I, I can see a future of, of engaging with different films that are related to, you know, policy work or, or different, you know, um, causes that I, you know, I, I care about or want to work um, towards uh, and and seeing now how film can be used for that and that there's definitely a bridge that needs to be made. And that's what impact producing is between the community, you know, uh, based 
spaces and, and the film spaces that are, you know, where more and more filmmakers are entering from the community who want to make films about their own communities. It's just this beautiful kind of bridge that is, is being built and needs to continue to be built. So I definitely see a future um, of exploring that. Um, and I also just see a future of um, whether or not I continue on being an impact producer uh, of just using this as a tool within um, community organizing and 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 bringing that to this, these nonprofit spaces, et cetera, that that I'm involved in. Um, but for an act of worship, I'm not done yet. I'm still, you know, we're still building out phase two. Uh, I'm a grad student, and so I have the flexibility to be able to 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 work on this part time. Um, and it's been really, really meaningful for me, and I'm excited about the ways that we can continue to do this. And, and we're also going to think about ways that we can, you know, make this self-sustainable for community spaces. Maybe we're not going to be in every space. I mean, we'll, we'll never have the capacity to be in every community space that we want to be in. But, you know, um, hopefully, uh, you know, using like the resources that we got from POV or creating more um, resources in, in collaboration with like the Muslim Wellness Foundation uh, or other organizations to, to create facilitation guides or just ways for the community to engage with the film on their own is also something that we're thinking about to, to give the film a life beyond you know, the, the limited campaign that we can create. I so appreciate your work in this space and how um, you all have been so thoughtful and committed to putting Muslim women in these leadership positions and putting them front and center and in, in representing for, for the entire community. Um, I, I want to bring in one uh, additional question from the audience. Um, this is for you, uh, Nosheen. Can you share your experience about learning to develop your impact plan as an early career um, documentary and nonfiction film filmmaker? So um, earlier in your career, how, how did you develop an impact plan? How has your thinking evolved from kind of then to now? Um, I, I think I probably didn't know the word impact campaign until I was part of the Firelight family. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I was in the, the producing fellowship and we had a whole retreat that was dedicated to impact. And that was when we started to think about, um, you know, what, what the life of the film is beyond the film. And, um, I, I mean, I, I think just generally doc filmmakers are in such a unique space that not a, like people write books that could have an impact campaign. People make fiction films that could have an impact campaign and they don't do that. Um, and so I think one, there's, there, there is this feeling of responsibility that is sometimes hard to navigate because you're also like just an artist and you want to create something. Um, but I think, yeah, I think Firelight, I, like that, that retreat was a huge part of of thinking about what a campaign could look like. And, you know, with my first film, it was about women who had been injured in an earthquake. And um, we had this, like, I guess I could look at it as an impact campaign now where I was just sharing stories about what I was seeing on the ground and able to fundraise and like, you know, help, help the community that we were filming with um, it like sort of in real time. And uh, and then after, you know, try, tried to find partners to to share that film with to see if they would be able to, you know, use it for their work. And um, but like didn't really have like a clear vision of what that looked like or understand like what partnerships look like. And and, you know, the between the, the producing fellowship and then doing the impact fellowship with Firelight, like that was. The impact fellowship was super eye-opening um you know because it was talking about small things things that seem are seemingly small like how long do you keep people at a venue what kind of venue you know are you should you be thinking about um you know what kind of partners do you have and what does it really mean to have a partnership with those people like in terms of resource sharing or you know whatever it is and so that really helped um, me kind of figure out what is the, the arc of the campaign and you know even thinking about things like um, you know what's the what's the narrative change that you want to see with a campaign where I'm like I don't even I don't know what those words mean and you know and um, I like that that fellowship really helped me figure a lot of that out and I think um, the biggest <clears throat> takeaway 
that we've had, um, and Abir and I were talking about this in preparation for this call, was to um, rather than thinking about like big picture, and sometimes there are there like there is a lot of potential with the big picture. Um, it it's really like you know those small spaces where realistically we also can have the most impact. You know, we were like trying to pack theaters across the country and essentially doing like what is like sort of a self-distributed release, but that requires massive amount of resources. Um, and we're not, you know, a, a studio or even like, you know, a publicist that has that those kinds of resources. And, and so then really thinking, like I said, about, you know, having like a specific partner and knowing what are the specific goals and really um, being okay with not being able to do everything and just saying like, if, if we can do these three things or if we can reach like these like specific communities, then, then, you know, and, and if we can, if you can have like some impact on one person, I think that's also a really, it feels like at least enough for me. Um, and so we had somebody that we interviewed in the film who came to one of our screenings and who's now like trying to interview her dad based on, you know, what, what she took away from the film. And I'm like, you're creating a community archive. Like that's such a win for us. Um, yeah. So I don't, I feel like I've gone past your question, but. <laughs> no, spot on. I think uh, a lot of people will gain some, some insight and some tips from, from your response. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining this thought-provoking and exciting masterclass conversation. I uh, really appreciate you all sharing your time and your thoughts with us. Um, check out an act of worship on PBS and the PBS app. Um, I would like to say thank you to our panelists. If you'd like more information on them and their films, their full bios are available at firelightmedia.tv on the events page. And please keep up to date with Firelight Media and the Beyond Resilience series by visiting Firelight Media's website at firelightmedia.tv. Thank you. Thank you.